there are going to be challenges. Um, there are serious challenges uh, that we're going to have to overcome. And the bad news is those challenges are constant. Um, they're never going away. Right? You're never going to be able to fix accessibility where you are. Um, in many ways, that mirrors the challenges that people with um, cognitive issues or developmental issues that they experience. Those issues aren't going away either. right? Um, so that's why the commitment we have to be willing to make is that we're going to have a positive attitude about the challenges. And so I'm going to be saying, giving bad news, but I'm going to try the best I can to give it in a positive way. Uh, because uh, that's uh, when I was brought on board by Dan, that a third of the time, I, I work on some other regulatory affairs at the university, but a third of the time my concern was going to be, are our online programs as inclusive as possible? Is there anything we can do to do better in that area? Um, Part of the charge was to stay up on the law. Part of the charge was to figure out, well, what is the minimum we need to do? Um, but the idea that we want to go beyond that, we want to embrace the challenge, we want to do better than just what the legal uh, requirements are, uh, is something that I've been uh, you know, very excited to be a part of. And it, it really can be positive and rewarding work. And my work with, uh, with Brent's group and the ATCC has been great. Uh, but it is challenging. And so we're going to address some of those challenges now. Uh, you're going to encounter challenges of buy-in, uh, getting people to believe that this is something that they should work on, uh, that um, it's something that everybody needs to be concerned about. Uh, it's it, probably fair to say that uh, some people um, have encountered challenges already or buy-in challenges. That I don't think it's unique to Temple that there are going to be people uh, that are going to be resistant or hostile. Uh, that there are going to be problems of getting people to do something about this. Some of those challenges or some of that lack of buy-in uh, can be related to cost. What's it going to cost? How much is it going to cost? Is there a cost-effective way to do it or not? Um, others can be related to, well, is it going to reach, the, is it the, uh, the most efficient use of uh, resources? Is it going to help enough people to justify the cost. How many people are really going to benefit from this? If there's really only a very small subsection of the population with documented disabilities, how many people are we really helping? Is this really what we should be concerned about? Um, and nothing bad's happened to us yet, right? We haven't been sued. Nobody said anything about it. I think we're doing a great job then, right? Um, other people, maybe, uh, again, hostility or, or not caring, apathy. Um, you need to be ready for this. You need to be ready for these kinds of challenges. You need to be ready for that pushback. Uh, and also be recognizing that just because you get someone to buy in, you might have to do it all over again. Uh, when people start to see, again, dollar figures, or when they start to feel as if they're being overly burdened, uh, that it's not a one and done, that you're going to have to constantly be ready to engage people. And uh, what I've found uh, that, that helps is just trying to figure out what is motivating the hostility or what's motivating the resistance, and try to come up with responses. Uh, that you're not always going to persuade everybody very often. Uh, you can leave the room feeling as if you haven't reached anybody or you haven't been able to accomplish what you set out to. Uh, but who knows where people are in their continuum of coming to grips with this. It's something we're all going to be living with. Uh, that Again, we want to be inclusive. We want, as educators, to do as much as we can to make sure that everyone is getting what they need from us. That's kind of the whole point of education, right? We're not like other areas where we can just kind of close the door, and I don't think we'd want to be. Um, things to stress, that technological advancements as they come are dramatically improving the cost efficiency. Uh, that what may be cost inefficient now could be cost efficient soon. That uh, we don't want to have a defeatist attitude and think, well, it's always going to cost as much as it does now. As we said, we've already encountered situations like with lecterns where costs come down and all of a sudden what was once an unfeasible solution is now very feasible. Uh, we do want to stress that everyone can benefit from an inclusive learning environment. Uh, there's all sorts of different benefits. These are just a few, but record keeping, the fact that you can go back and search things that you've heard um, is something that anyone can benefit from. So things are captioned and there's data recordings of it. That is something that's a wonderful study tool. It's a wonderful refreshing tool. Uh, greater interact interactivity that there's often when we're pushing ourselves to try to get to people in different ways uh, that we often end up making things better uh, when we're including sound and visual and audio when we're trying to engage people as much as possible we tend to make better products uh, and we're also when we're having more people involved in the conversations more voices are being heard and that's always a positive 
uh, especially voices that can come from situations where they haven't been listened to in the past. They can often offer perspectives that have not been considered. Uh, and as the legal training will tell you, it's always better to get on top of things. It's always cheaper to be proactive. Just because something terrible hasn't happened, uh, the fact that you haven't been doing anything is not going to save you uh, in any way. Right? That uh, it's always better to make some effort. It's always better to be proactive. Even if you fall short, it's going to be better than doing nothing and having some solution dictated to you. Uh, implementation. Okay, so great. You've gotten buy-in, or at least you've gotten a substantial amount of buy-in. Now what? Um, at first, it's going to seem very difficult to get on top of. It's going to seem overwhelming. Uh, it's going to take a lot of time. It's going to take a lot of conversations. Some decision makers may not want to get anywhere near this topic, right, for fear of ruining their career. Oh, my goodness, I don't want to be the person who fell short on accessibility and got the university sued. How about you guys take care of that? Um, that could happen. Um, we've been very lucky at Temple. We've had a lot of buy-in from leadership, but that still takes time. And it takes, again, constantly having people re-buy in to make sure you can maintain that momentum. Uh, it's going to seem overwhelming, but as, as was suggested by our earlier speaker, Dr. Rapp, that a little bit, just get started, right? A little bit will gradually decrease the obstacles in front of you. Um, but know that it's not always going to be one way, that it's not always going to, not everything you try is going to work, that there's going to be failures, there's going to be missteps, and don't let that fear scuttle you from trying to do new things, that, again, making the effort's always worth it. Worth it. Um, Technical deficiencies, sometimes it's personal technical deficiencies, sometimes it's institutional, that when you're really putting um, the microscope on what you do, that you can find a lot of issues that you maybe didn't expect, that a lot of uh, the work we've done, we, we've joked in the office that we tend to shine lights on things, and not always, not, people don't always appreciate that. Um, it exposes things that people didn't really want to have exposed, but then again, there are also people that go, wow, I didn't know that link was inaccessible. I didn't know that that wasn't working. Thanks for bringing it to our attention. Always try to look on the positive side of things. Um, and also be ready that when it comes to faculty, you, you don't want to be dictating to people and telling them this is how to teach. Right? They have strong opinions about how to teach. It's what they do best. Um, you want to try to empower them as much as possible while also saying we want your classrooms to be as inclusive as possible. Um, so we, can we find a way to make it work? Can we find a compromise solution that's acceptable to you? Can we do something that's going to give you the freedom you want uh, while also being able to be as inclusive as you, I'm sure, want it to be. Uh, but not everybody's going to be ready to make those kinds of sacrifices. Um, some people will just say, well, the heck with it. I'm not going to use it, right? I can't make it accessible or it's going to be too much work. I'm not going to use that very important, useful, thing, useful tool. Um, you want to discourage that, right? Uh, that we heard earlier, um, Ms. Russell's, her parents, or I'm sorry, her mother and grandmother, uh, finding creative solutions, um, that that's, what we, that's the kind of attitude we want to engender in all of our uh, staff, is can we figure out a way to make it work without having to sacrifice really important content? Is there a new tool? Is there something we can do uh, before we give up, right? Is there a way to figure this out? Um, so often what we want to try to do is encourage people to make their pedagogical choices early, right? Say that they value something so that, we, not to back them into a corner, but to say, okay, you said this is valuable. Let's figure out a way to get this important content. Let's figure out a way to get this important tool, whatever it is, to your students. Let's figure out a way to engage people as much as possible. Uh, and we've got to resist that temptation to say, well, somebody's not holding up their end of the bargain. Somebody's not doing what they need to do. Let's just go ahead anyway. Um, it's hard, right? It takes a lot of resolve to say, look, this isn't right. This isn't accessible. This isn't inclusive. This isn't what we want to represent ourselves as, we've got to stop, wait, and figure it out. Deadlines, budgets, it's difficult, right? Uh, but again, if you want to make that commitment, if it's something you really want to say is important to your institution and to you personally to try to create in, uh, inclusive learning environments, you got to have that resolve and not give in to that temptation uh, to move ahead. And then uh, maintenance. Right? Not want to be defeated by victory. That, uh, that's something that you know, we feel wonderful at Temple for all the good work that we've done and to be recognized for it is amazing. Uh, but we know we have a long way to go. Uh, and we don't want to be uh, caught up in back padding and believing that we're on top of things. We are you know, a shining example for everyone to follow. No, we know we have a long way to go. Uh, and that the best attitude uh, to take is that, again, it's a constant challenge. 
It's never going away. You're never going to be done. Never, you're never going to be in a position, and we've heard from some experts uh, at the other conference that we were at that have the same attitude. If they can get to 80, 90 percent, they are absolutely ecstatic. Uh, but new content, new programs, new faculty, new challenges, uh, new students, new expectations, you're never done. Right? It's going to be constantly changing. The environment's going to be changing. Uh, the legal regimes are going to be changing. Um, I believe, from what I can see, that the, the tide in higher ed is turning and that greater levels of accountability are going to be expected uh, and that it's going to be more and more difficult for institutions to meet those obligations unless they're really willing to make the commitments it takes uh, to do so and that to be left behind or to do, as, to do the bare minimum is, is going to be increasingly precarious and that's not where any of us really want to be. Uh, so the more embedded inclusiveness, and I use that in term inclusiveness, that, that's been part of uh, our conversations with Depart uh, Disability Resources and Services. What language should we be using? That accessibility is great, um, but really we, all we want to be moving towards this idea of inclusion. Right? The obligation is on us to make an inclusive environment, to be making sure we are not excluding anyone, that everyone is included. If we're leaving people out, we're not meeting our obligations. Um, so the more embedded that attitude can become, the better. Uh, but change is difficult. Uh, that again, some of the work I do involves other regulations that the university is a little less enthusiastic about. Temple is very enthusiastic about accessibility, not so much in other areas. Change takes time, it's difficult. Um, but uh, even when you have a clearly implemented legal regime, that it's not always going to be clear what it need, how that applies to you, how that applies to your situation. How do you figure out how do I meet my legal obligations within my current context? Um, so I think, again, if I can leave with any thought, it's that these challenges are going to be constant, they are going to be difficult, but they are surmountable if you're able to create the kind of um, the critical mass, I could say, or the, the momentum that we have at Temple, uh, and that our job, uh, and I think we all take it very seriously, is trying to sustain that momentum. Uh, that that can be part of the most difficult part, really, is once you do start to make progress, um, to continue to do so and to try to continue to uh, embrace new challenges and find a way to help make as an inclusive a learning environment as you can. So. Just going to end on one last slide to sort of show you guys where we're, where we're moving right now. Um, so we've sort of transitioned from the phase of getting this initiative off and running, which has been you know several years in the making, and now really looking at, okay, looking backwards, what's working, what's not, do we need to reinvestigate things? Um, and so I'm going to leave this up. I'm not going to talk a ton to it in case people have um, questions. But um, one of the big things that I think is going to be beneficial to us, um, you know, the fact that there are some people that either aren't aware or don't entirely buy into it, is that we're going to be rolling out this, um, this HR training session so that they, basically everybody has a general awareness. There's no more, you know, ignorance to, the, to what their responsibilities are, um, both faculty, staff, part-time adjuncts everybody will be exposed to this training. So they at least know what their responsibilities are, and if they have questions and you know, want to get additional help, they know where to go for that help. Hi, my question is, you mentioned here that HR is gonna do an awareness training. Is that a training that they're building? Are they purchasing it? Um, subscribes to a company called We Comply for all of our human resource training, like everybody probably has seen, like the sexual harassment training, hazmat training and things. Um, and so we are actively building a module that will be used, deployed through We Comply. So you're, you're customizing a We Comply training? Is we are. We, we went down the road of trying to figure out if it could be generic enough to be distributed broadly, and some of the content we had was very specific. Um, we did hear from We Comply that they may take this and take portions of it and spin it off that would be more broadly available, but the one that we're developing is unique. Great. I, I do have a quick second question. You had in your presentation, you mentioned a tool that um, you purchased to uh, check for compl um, ADA compliance on uh, websites. What tool is that? Uh, the, the tool that we have is called uh, High Software. It's Compliance Sheriff. Um, I, I'll, I'll caution everybody on any sort of bulk scanning accessibility tools um, because it's it's really difficult to scan a batch of pages and get a reliable result. And we've actually had some difficulty to the level of, you know, it reporting false pro positives and creating additional stress in departments that, that maybe wasn't even there before. Um, so 
we're also lucky enough that we're university wide. Our president put a big emphasis on our websites. So the majority of schools and colleges are going through redesigns actively. So we can um, do remediation on the templates that are being rolled out before it's university wide. Um, the additional piece that I'll put on that is the timeline that's imposed for websites is only on websites, and this is pretty standard for policies I've seen from websites created after a certain date. So ours is, you know, if it's a legacy website, it hasn't been updated since 2011, don't spend your time getting that fixed, get the relevant content moving forward fixed. So I, there, there's not a ton of tools out there and all of them have their deficiencies. When you mentioned uh, websites, so is that for content just on the web? Are you using any kind of checker that could be used to check the content in Blackboard? Uh, we're not currently. We've had a bunch of vendors we've talked to, um, but it's it's a difficult process. One of the things that, that I'm looking forward to is we're actually switching from a hosted Blackboard solution to an online Blackboard solution. And for a faculty member to migrate from the hosted solution to the new cloud-based solution, they're going to have to check a box saying that they've evaluated their, their content for accessibility. So there's no built-in checker. But at least it's, it's putting the onus on them that they're saying, yes, I did this um, when they move it across. Or at least bring their awareness of it. Great. Thank you very much. Fred, the next question is over here. I have a question from today's meeting from Todd from Iowa. He'd like to know how many people or positions are involved in accessibility efforts at Temple and what kind of FTE you have. <laughs> um, so speaking to actually people that have dedicated 100% of their time for accessibility, um, the, the true answer is zero. Um, this is something that's, that's being tasked across several people. Again, the liaison model. Myself, I have additional responsibilities within computer services as well. Um, and as far as how that equates to any kind of a FTE number, I don't have an accurate number for that. Um, but the people in the ATCC take it very seriously. And even though there might not be people that have this as their specific job description, when we're tasked with an express uh, an explicit accessibility issue, it can become 100% of your, you know, attention for that period of time. Thank you. Being one of the only students in this room, you're talking about um, HR training, awareness training. Have you looked at looking at it in terms of uh, any type of training for students who are coming into campus so that they're receiving some type of maybe orientation training on, uh, on I, how to handle I situations. don't know that there's as broad, like general uh, student university training. I know that there is within the Disability Resource Services Center. So I don't know that that's catching the people that you know don't want to disclose or don't have it, it diagnosable or it's a temporary situation. Um, but there's, there isn't any broad student orientation coming in just on accessibility as a whole. The Office of Digital Education has just created the online.temple.edu uh, uh, website. And we have a student resource tab. Uh, soon we're going to be featuring a student readiness in general uh, a video there. And uh, a part of, part of the script will be dedicated to those individuals who uh, have a disability or think they have a disability to reach out to that particular group. But that's about as, ex as explicit as we get. What about sensitivity training? I mean, we're talking about accessibility training, but what about sensitive sensitivity training? It is included. That same the same one has you know it, it sort of at least goes partially down the road of the you know appro um, correct approach to a student um, and being discreet. You know, so it does go down that line about like okay, not only do you have accommodations you have to meet, but the way that you approach the student if they have that request, you know, what what is appropriate and what's not. Yeah, I think it's important to stress that our, our disability resources and services group is very active in that area, that we don't want to represent ourselves as, as the extent of Temple's commitment to it, that there are a lot of other offices and groups that do a lot of work. Our accessible technology focus is what brings us here, but it, that there is a lot of awareness building and a lot of efforts that they do. Um, and we, we really try to piggyback off of a lot of their good work. I noticed that in your model, the CIO leads this effort, which is kind of unique. Is there a reason why you chose that as opposed to having the accessibility office or compliance offices kind of leading the whole project? Uh, I, well, I would think the genesis of it. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming the Disability Resource Services Department would have wanted this to happen a long time ago. I mean, I haven't had that dialogue. Um, however, you know, the resources that are at the fingertips of Disability Resource Services is probably a, a pretty small subset of what, you know, the CIO's office would. 
Um, so um, we were, unfortunately, we were lucky enough to have a CIO and a VP that recognized the concern um, and put a concerted effort to it. Um, and he was willing, the fact that it was the Accessible Technology Initiative, to take it within our, within our umbrella, at least leading the charge. Um, I do know that there was a, a distinct effort that when selecting liaisons to not simply go to computer services representatives within those schools and colleges to, to extend the outreach, um, but it was, I don't want to say happenstance, but you know, it just so happened that he, he was aware, he knew it was an issue, and he was willing to take it on. So to, to make that issue from the ground up, I, I can't give you a, a, a good way to bring it to people necessarily, or a, a direct line of you know, how to get it started from, from a lower level. And as a disability services provider, I think it's fabulous that it's you know, that division doing it because people get tired of us always being the ones to ring that bell and to you know, bring that up. And so it gets listened to in a different way if it's coming from different parts of the institution. So I think it's a benefit. So I have the opportunity to talk to a lot of our um, campus leaders um, about um, accessibility and online learning, and um, uh, and and it's uh, it's interesting to me the that there's you know uh, um, very much a willingness to be responsive to um, students who declare that they need accommodations, and there's formal process for that, and that is in existence. But as soon as you start talking about um, things like universal design or um, being proactive, there are things that you can do up front that can minimize the cost, that effort, that level of initiative, like what you've undertaken, um, you know, uh, has to be weighed against all the other priorities of the campus. And I'm just wondering if you could say a little bit about what it was at Temple, um, you know, that, that allowed it to become the priority that it is and to be so pervasive and have the buy-in across the institution. Like, what, what was the, the, you know, um, element that that allowed it, allowed you to get there because I think some campuses are still struggling with that piece of it. Well, again, uh, uh, to reiterate, you know, the CIO taking charge of it, and you know, as much as we don't want to say it was because you know our big brother, temp, you know, Penn State, you know, in the center of the state, you know, that it happened to them, but I think that that had you know part, was part of the reason as well. I mean, as you saw the first slide, there's three research institutions in Pennsylvania, you know, ourselves, Pittsburgh, and Penn State. So the fact that it was that close to home, you know. I think there was a trigger in the back of people's minds, okay, are they going to look at us next? Um, but I do know that what I have seen that uh, I think where broader adoption might happen at the, at the campus level is some of the things, you know, that there's, there's more and more studies being done on uh, learning objectives being met by people with captioning. So not just approaching it from accessibility, but if you caption, uh, you know, class capture, to sit down and watch the whole capture again an hour long you know, attention spans are getting shorter and shorter and shorter. I think that's, that's somewhere in the neighborhood of five or six minutes that a student's going to sit and watch a video for. So all of a sudden, if you introduce transcripts and they're searchable and there's a particular topic that they were missing, this is no longer an accessibility benefit. This is a, a substantial benefit. And in some cases, if you look at it in advance, you can quantify, you know, performance. And I think that that might be the road that some schools have to go. Is like, okay, we have demonstrated grade performance. You know, let's pick a class. We're going to caption everything. We're going to provide it as searchable and look at the, the benefit to everybody. And I also think that the 508 refresh that's coming, I, I think the government does want to have a more clear, explicit set of expectations for institutions uh, that, that perhaps could serve as the equivalent of walking up with the Penn State settlement and putting it on somebody's desk, that if that comes out from the federal government clearly outlining expectations, um, I think that a lot of people are, you don't want to wait for that, uh, but that could definitely be something of a clincher or something that could add some weight to any internal leadership discussions. Uh, besides accessibility, another hot topic buzzword is retention. And so just kind of what triggered and uh, came to my mind is that you said, you know, this the captioning extends and helps uh, persons with or without disabilities. So is Temple initiating any research on whether these searchable transcripts are benefiting their students? Uh, we are not. Um, and that's like a great idea. <laughs> and we might have to formalize that. Well, what, what we have had is, is there's, th this is happening, I feel like, part and parcel with as we have more and more uh, vendors that are coming in with e-textbooks, and there's more sort of uh, media included in that, and they are providing dashboards and mechanisms for like, okay, this is how you're measuring results. So my guess is, is although it's not currently being looked at, it's more because we don't have a tool 
in place. I think as, that's one of the criteria that's going to be included as we start looking at the vendors and what they're providing for you know digital. Um, because I'm wondering if, if that might also be another way to kind of engage with campus leaders as well. It also helps with retention. It's a, a nice, an all another nice way of putting it. Yep. So let's take a moment to, to thank our partners. Um, we do have um, our next presentation um, is coming up, and just want to give um, a little intro to that. And I'm glad that you recognize the, the flow of today because we look at kind of as a um, a larger what, what we can do within you know within the system or on our campus. Um, and our next presentation that is going to come up. Um, is about the IITG or the Innovative Technology um, grants that campuses can apply for um, in regards to um, different innovation pieces on campus. And this year, um, the IITG awards were provided to three campuses in regards to accessibility. So we do have a panel um, to talk about those individual um, components that is happening on their campus. So 